Welcome to the One Hero Podcast, where we answer Malaysians' burning questions about personal finance with fact-based answers. Without a doubt, AI is changing the world. From asking chat GPT questions to creating unique visuals with mid-journey, we are now in a world where almost every aspect of our lives is or will be touched by AI. For GPU maker NVIDIA, whose chips power about 80% of AI tools, this is great news. In fact, NVIDIA's favorable position in AI saw its shares surge 24% just over a week ago, allowing NVIDIA to join the likes of Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, and Microsoft in the trillion dollar market cap club. But are we all getting a little bit too excited by the potential of NVIDIA and ignoring all its pitfalls? Or are we in the best position to invest in NVIDIA today? Welcome back to the One Hero Podcast. This is episode three of Stop Investing from Zero, where we help beginners understand how to analyze stocks from scratch. So John, if I was a beginner in stock investing and I'm seeing all this frenzy around AI and NVIDIA, where should I actually look first? Uh, I think for the gamers out there, they will shout hooray because they've been wanting to get a hold of an NVIDIA graphics card for all this while. So yeah. if you're not from the gaming space, never heard of this company, and then suddenly all of a sudden, there's a lot of hype around it, right? We always anchor ourselves into the four basic investing questions. Now, I'm going to go through the question first, and I'm going to go deeper into each question, right? So the first question is... Um, what business do they do and how do they make money? Obviously, you alluded to some of it in your introduction. The second question is, are they actually profitable? And are they financially stable doing that? Just to give you a hint, ChatGPT just like was the most downloaded app in history. I think over five days or something, I think it crossed, it, it crossed one million user downloads or something wow. like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like... Yeah, it's much bigger than Facebook, whatever, lah, right? But at the same time, why I'm using ChatGP is because they're burning through seven, I mean, um, certain sources say they're burning through 700 million a year, all right, in terms of expenses, but they're not profitable. So yes, it may be the biggest high, but anchoring back to the second question is, are they profitable and financially stable? They're not. There's a lot of uh, VC money, uh, startup money being thrown at them by Microsoft, but as a profitable business, not. Not yet, okay? The third is, who is the audience and how big can they be? That means today, uh, Facebook has, what, 2 billion, close to 3 billion users. So that's the size of the market, right? And and yeah, how big can they actually grow? And last but not least, it may be a great company. It may be profitable. It may have a potentially large audience, but are they currently cheap or expensive? And I don't mean the share price. So the four questions, what business are they in? Are they profitable? Who's their audience and how big can they grow? And are they cheap or inexpensive? So far, so good, Uwe. So far, so good. Very excited okay. because I, I mean, I come from a gaming perspective. I know and because only as a gamer, li little less, uh, you know, about the, the rest of the business. So I'm very excited to see what you have to share. Great. So um, first question, we dive straight into it, right? What business do they do and how do money so obviously one part of it is the graphics card but what's the best way or the best source for you to find out the information is actually to go to just google and ask uh what do they do you know so i'm gonna literally share my screen right now and um yeah let's go through this the best way is actually getting into their investor deck uh, most big companies like Microsoft, Amazon, every quarter, they'll host what we call an analyst brief or investor brief. And these investor briefs, they actually will give you what we call an investor deck. So I was just Googling earlier before the podcast and they actually have an investor day for 2022. You can actually download the whole uh, deck and read through it, you know, uh, most of it will be gibberish, especially if you're not a technical guy, right? It's like, it will sound German. But it will kind of give you, uh, you know, um, a perspective of what business are they in. Now, the other source of information to find out um, whether what business are they in is actually the annual report. And um, obviously, it's quite daunting for those who never read it. But if you scroll through it 
and you kind of like read the table of content and headlines, what you want to find out is this thing called the business overview. And it's literally on page four, okay? It, it provides a very quick summary. It just says, okay, business of, overview. It pioneered accelerated computing. Okay, some people don't know what the term, most people don't know what term. To solve most challenging computational problems. Okay, so they are basically in computing. They virtually try to solve or accelerate uh, mathematical problems, I guess, right? And we specialize in a market where our computing, which our computing platforms can provide tremendous acceleration for application. Okay, for, for those not non-technical guys, I'm like, what on earth is this, you know? But as you scroll down, then you see this part called the fiscal reportable segments. Ah, okay. Hopefully it makes sense. Our two reportable segments are compute and networking and graphics. And this is what I like about, you know, uh, US uh, annual reports reporting standards. So you see here, our platform addresses four large markets where our expertise are critical. Can you see this part, Louis? Mm, yep. Okay. So you talked about gaming cards, right? Uh, gamings. Yep. It, it, it's fall under this thing called the gaming. Oh. So from gaming alone, they generate about 9.1 billion in revenue. Huh. I'm, yeah. surpri I'm surprised it's not the biggest revenue it's not the biggest right and, yeah. yeah again you see I so yeah. it didn't take you more than five minutes to get to this page right i mean mm -hmm. obviously i had it preloaded but anyone yeah. with a uh, internet connection or or a computer um, will be able to get here you just maybe you know overwhelmed you see what annual report 500 pages and you just like mm. so here i'm giving you the tip look for a segment usually it's the first 10 to 15 pages it's called a business overview and if you can't find it there, look for what we call a chairman's statement or a management discussion and analysis. So it will actually write, I, obviously for the first time you read it, most of it will sound gibberish to you. Uh, what I've seen over the years is quality of annual reports have gotten, gotten better and better, especially good companies. And they actually have a chart or a graph uh, or a table. So you can gleam a lot from one chart actually. So you kind of see, right? Even though you may not, fully comprehend all the technicalities or the terms, you already see, ah, they make money from gaming, okay? And obviously, they make graphics card for gaming. But their chunk of the revenue, as you alluded earlier in the introduction, was from AI. But hmm. AI in what part? It's under data centers. Because hmm. a lot of these uh, data centers or cloud computing solutions, as we call it, that's where the... Uh, 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 AI capabilities actually come from. So you go to like, for example, chat GPT, mm -hmm. you, how do you access it? Through a, uh, through a web a app. Uh, or yeah, for like a web app or a browser. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously you need an internet connection and how, how is that process is on, on data centers like this. Uh. So even though you're not technical, you realize that, hey, okay, uh, they make gaming, they make money from selling gaming cards, they make money from probably selling chips to data centers to process. Uh, they make oh, professional visualization. Actually, hmm. this is a very niche but growing segment for them. Okay. And last but not least, this, can you, were, were you, are you surprised that they're actually in automotive? Yeah, I'm quite surprised. Is, is that new? No, it's not. Oh. So, you know your Tesla cars? Uh-huh. Uh, prior to Tesla coming out of their own chips, every Tesla car has an NVIDIA chip. Oh, wow. You know, all your self-driving, your lane assist, uh -huh. your cruise control, all that, all that requires computing power. And NVIDIA makes one of the best automotive AI chips in the world, actually. Oh, wow. That's yeah. interesting. That's yeah, interesting. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you can see, right, even though data centers are contributing a big chunk of it, can you see which is the fastest growing one, Louis? Hmm, the automotive. Correct. Of course, wow. it's from a small base, but it's growing year on year. And I mean, like, let's forget about NVIDIA. Let's come back to reali reality, okay? Um, even if you buy, uh, I, I, I think for those younger ones who are watching today, Go and look back at your parents' car, let's just say. Don't, don't talk about a very fancy model. Uh. Let's talk about MyV. A MyV five years, ten years ago, you don't have a push-start button. Mm. You don't have LED screens. 
you don't have like, you know, on your side mirrors today, even for my V, uh, there's a, a blind spot detector control, you know. So if there's like a car coming and then there's a teet on your, your rear view mirror, all those require electronic computing power and all that kind of thing, right? Where is it coming from? It's from chips. Oh. And one of the major guys is NVIDIA. Wow, so, that's amazing. Yeah. So if you buy a slightly more expensive car, like a Japanese car, do you realize that last time if you cruise control, that means you drive your car, you hit 80 kilometers an hour and you don't want to go any faster, right? You press the cruise control and you will stay steady at 80. You don't need to press the accelerator, am I correct? But now cars, right? When you drive and you you set it at 80, but there's a car in front, you normally have to press the brake yourself manually, correct? There's this thing called adaptive cruise control. So the car in front is suddenly slowing down to 70, you set at 80, your car also slows down to 70 automatically. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so that's adaptive cruise control. So so a lot of these, these are all application examples that the world of automotive is undergoing this change. You see, more sensors, um, more smartness in the car, for the lack of a better word. And yeah, NVIDIA is like, has been singing this song for the past 10 to 15 years, uh, to be honest. Wow, and, 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 and now they're like in the absolutely best position to capitalize on it. Precisely, precisely. So... It's almost that fulfilling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, every time... Actually, in the past, a lot of people just think NVIDIA is just selling graphics card. And then they said, which is answering question three, how big is their audience, right? Because mm. if you think about gaming, the audience is mainly teenagers to young adults, maybe very little, a very sliver of like 40-year-olds that play games to distress, right? But you would think that, oh, the market is just limited to that. But the moment you come into cloud computing, data centers, professional visualization, automotive, uh, what happens to the third question I usually ask? How big is the audience? It just suddenly balloon, you know. Yeah. Correct or not? Right? Yeah. But in the past, so so when analysts now, because NVIDIA is very famous, right? When analysts actually ask, hey, uh, Jensen, why didn't you tell us about all this? Yeah, I've been telling you guys for 20 years, but you guys never listen. <laughs> no, actually, he does say this on interviews. A lot of people couldn't understand what he was building back then. But he, as a vision, I really love Jensen, super humble guy, super on the ball. I, I mean, I've watched uh, many of his interviews, including the one he he talked to Maurice Chung. So, Louis, I, I know we've not discussed this uh, in the past, but Maurice Chung is the founder of TSMC. Oh, I was, yeah. And yeah. TSMC was super critical to the survival of NVIDIA because NVIDIA did not have enough money to build their own chips. They designed the chips, but they don't build it. So Maurice Chang, in a way, came to NVIDIA's rescue and a lot of other uh, companies like Apple to their rescue is because he said, don't worry about building them. I'll build them for you. You just design them. And he spoke glowingly, Mor uh, Jensen spoke glowingly about Maurice because Maurice visited him at his office to understand his problem during his honeymoon, he slunk away. His wife didn't know. They were having a honeymoon. He went to he went to Jensen's office to talk, brought his notepad in his suit, whatever, right? And then only later that uh, Jensen found out it was his, actually his honeymoon. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, I mean, one so, could say that, you know, at that time, he also gave life to something else. <laughs> Correct, 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 <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I think, um, yeah, the, the, the beauty about um, people or leaders with very long visions is they stick to that core focus and they, they stick to it very well. Even though at that point of time, people didn't understand them. Mm. But obviously today, he's enjoying the fruits of his labor. Yeah. He owns, in I think... Future. Yeah, all in the future. Yeah, all in the future. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, he only owns like three to four percent of the company, but three to four yeah. percent yeah. it's like one trillion, uh ten uh, percent is hundred billion, right? So hundred billion, correct? Ten uh, percent is hundred billion, correct? So three to four percent, you're talking about three to four hundred million a billion of the company, you know. Hey, wait, uh, yeah, hundred million. He's a billionaire. He's a billionaire. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely a billionaire. I'm like, wow, you know, so uh, yeah, question number one, what business do they do? How do they make money? Here you have the answer. Okay, 
So moving on to the next question, are they profitable and financially stable doing that? Okay, there's many ways. And uh, one, one the, the most direct source is actually on the annual report. Obviously, you grow down to the okay, control F and you type income statement, okay, or profit and loss statement. Okay, wow, they didn't use these terms. So financial statement then, okay. Then it becomes too wide. <laughs> okay. So usually it's under financial statements that you can find the uh, uh, the accounting numbers. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll down. Oh, I know, I can just do a preview. Ah, there you go. So when you see tables, oh, this is the number of shares they have. It's the corporate reporting. Oh, it's down here. So usually it's either in the middle section or right to the end of the report. Okay, yeah, here you go, net income. Consolidated, uh, okay, so yeah, they call it comprehensive income, okay. Uh, so you can see here, revenue is as of January 29th, 2020, 2023, which means their financial year end is uh, on January 29th. They made 26 billion, because this is in millions, 26 billion. Uh, the gross profit 15, um, yeah. Do you notice that on an annual report, this one is, you're very lucky, you get three years of comparison, 2021, 2022, 2023. But most annual reports, they only give you two years of comparison. That means the current year and the preceding year, okay? So rather than me going through this multiple annual reports to get like a 10-year history or 15-year history, I usually rely on what I call financial data aggregators. And one of my favorite tools is actually this uh, this portal called uh, Ticker Terminal. If you want to learn more or whatever, uh, I'll put them in the links uh, in the show notes below. Um, yeah, so this is uh, NVIDIA's uh, financial history. So I go to detail financials. As you can see, I can drag the number of years I want to see. So if I want to like see all the way till 2002, yeah, they don't have they don't have it but they have it till 2014. So I'm going to drag it until 2014, okay? So then the beauty of it, I can plot, uh, Louis, I can plot it into a graph automatically. Oh. So then I can get the sales and I can get the net income, which is their profit. So it's much easier to see, okay. So you see 2022, they made much more. Um, I'm not going to do the details of it, but remember you said, uh, you know NVIDIA because of their gaming cards. Yeah. Uh, okay. Correct. Gaming cards aren't just used for gaming. Gaming cards are also used for crypto mining. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah, that's true. Remember? That's true. Yes. My friends are yeah. buying a lot of NVIDIA for that, yeah. Correct, correct. So in 2021, 20, 2020, 2021, 2022 was the craze for crypto mining because crypto just shot through the roof, remember? Yeah. And that... Uh, in China, everyone was hoarding graphics card. I remember I was building on my own PC in 2021. It was so expensive to get a graphics card. It always uh, out of stock, actually. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Find stock. Yeah. Everyone, everyone, they force you to buy not just the graphics card, they force you to buy the whole PC that is custom built. Yeah. Because they want to make money over mm. and above, you know, scalping. Lah. So, yeah. The reason why I share, want to share that was because if you look at NVIDIA, a huge, it had a huge spike in net profit in 2021 and 2022. And, and one of the contributors to that was the mining, the crypto mining. Okay, So now come back to normalized levels. Even though revenue shot up, we come back to normalized levels. Okay, So are they profitable? Definitely, yes. Because like you look at the years since 2014, they've been... Look at how big they've grown, Louis. Just imagine, uh, 2014, they were only 4.1 billion in sales. And like 2023, which is like nine years later or 10 years later, is like 26. So six, 20, uh, it's about seven, six and a half times. Six and a half times their size. Uh, it's, it's quite yeah. crazy. Uh. It's quite in crazy. Like less than 10 years, a decade, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Six and a half times, you know, you, 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 you ask any of your businessmen friends, how many people can grow their business six and a half times yeah. in nine years? It's, it's not easy, right? Okay, so are they cash flow positive? Now, profit, um, it's, it's only one indication, but I always like to look at the cash flow statement and see whether they are cash flow positive as well, operating cash flow. So I plot it out, it's in green. Yes, they're cash flow positive means over and above what people owe them, are they still being paid, right, in cash? Mm. Yes, the short answer is that yes, okay. 
So that's the second question. Profitable and financially stable? Yes, they are. Okay. And um, rather than going through an annual report, which only gives you like one to two years of comparison, um, I like to use what I call financial data aggregators to get the historical, okay, to see the trend. Okay. Next question. Who is their audience and how big can they grow? Actually, it was answered here already. If you recall earlier in my bookmark, yeah, um, okay, here. Close this, close this, so you get a bigger view. They already tell you who are their audiences. So data centers, as we all know, cloud computing is growing bigger and bigger. Uh, the usage of things like chat GPT, uh, LLM, large language models to actually train the AIs are getting bigger and bigger. You know, Google I.O., uh, at the Google I.O. conference, we talked about BARD, which is like the equivalent of chat GPT. All this is coming out now. Besides gaming and professional visualization, uh, uh, Louis, have you heard of the Weather Channel and you heard of uh, how they use AR? No, no, I don't know okay. that. Okay, so in Malaysia, it's only rain or uh, rain or shine, right? Uh, I'll show you what, what's the potential now. Have you seen photos like this, uh, Louis? No, no, this is the first time I've seen it. So wow. you see, this, she's reporting the weather. But can you look at the visualization or not? Wow, that's impressive. So th this this guy is reporting the weather, but <laughs> so entertainment, la, right? Entertainment. Uh, yeah, it's to make you know. Usually, people don't watch the weather channel for <laughs> entertainment purposes, right? But to make it more exciting, look at this 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 lady. Oh, <laughs> oh that's amazing! Cool, right? Yeah, it's quite cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. Where does the computing capability of all this come from? Mm, NVIDIA. Uh, oh, so that's what it means by professional visualization. Interesting. Correct, correct. 3D modeling, AR. Mm. AR just stands for augmented reality. That means you don't need to wear like a goggle. VR usually is like you have to be immersive in a goggle or whatever. This is like, yeah. Yeah. Actually, if you watch sports, um, I'll show you one, eh? Uh, AR in sports. sports. Can you see this? Oh. So you're watching the, the live telecast and you get this. <laughs> so like football, American football, you want to see the players, the touchdown. Yeah, look at this. It's it's quite insane. Uh. We we've we've haven't gotten to this level in Malaysia yet. Uh. No, yeah. not at all. I haven't seen anything like it in sports. Mm. Or anywhere like our weather channel. <laughs> yeah, it, it's coming. It's coming. So you got things like this, uh. you get the stats. No, uh, if you watch football or tennis, you know like uh, whether it crossed the line, cross the line of the goal or whatever, uh, this is how AR is being used. Uh. Oh. The foul line, you know, like uh, wow. if you watch football, there's this thing called offside. That means the last. Okay, so offside me just means like this is your the the team defending the goal, and then if the player runs behind the last man, it's called an offside. That means your goal is disallowed. But it's very hard to visualize on the field, so they actually use AR to actually draw the line for you. Yeah, all this requires processing. So the 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 the, the long to short of it is. All this is coming. All this is being powered by something. And that, hmm. that's where it comes out. Yeah. It's like almost unlimited potential. If it's oh, like... ex exactly. Exactly. So can you imagine next time storybooks, you open up, right? You know, in the past, we watch movies about storybooks and then, you know, the thing pops up. Hmm. <laughs> so instead of being fictional, it's now a reality. Dungeon, can you imagine Dungeons and Dragons, the dragons coming out at you? Uh, yeah, the warriors coming out. I would imagine like being a child at our age, maybe they, they wouldn't be able to tell what's real and what's fake Correct, anymore. correct, <laughs> correct, correct, correct. Yeah, and um, obviously I'm not going to go through the history. I'm, I'm a big fan of Jensen. I watch a lot of his interviews, but if you want to know more about this visionary leader leading uh, uh, NVIDIA, uh, you should really watch his interview he gave to the university about how they nearly went bankrupt. 
Mm. Nvidia in the early days when they nearly went bankrupt, uh, it was the last design. If that design failed and the the, the chip that they manufactured, you know, couldn't meet the spec or had some errors, that that's it. They they close shop really. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Really like a hairs. <laughs> Literally Mr. living yeah, on the edge, yeah. La, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, third question who's the audience and how big can they grow? I've basically answered some of it, okay. Um, so last but not least, um, are they cheap or expensive? Now, here comes the interesting part, favorite question. yeah. Everyone's favorite question, <laughs> favorite question. So, actually, the favorite question is can buy or cannot buy? So <laughs> 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 so here comes the valuation part. La. You know, you understand the business. There's, a, there's, a, there's always a business behind the stock. But whether cheap or expensive is to kind of determine whether you should at at is it an entry point or an exit point? Now, why is it expensive? Now, most of the time people look at share price. So we type NVIDIA share price. Okay, so I like to look at a historical. So uh, forty seven thousand percent, Louis. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, will you be happy with even half that results? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Forty seven thousand percent. That means it's four hundred and okay, one thousand percent is ten times. So this is four hundred and seventy times. That means your one dollar became four hundred and seventy dollars, huh? Wow. Am I making? Oh, I mean, hundred percent is one time, uh, one time your money. You put one dollar, you get one dollar back, uh, so it becomes two dollars, uh. If it's one thousand percent, is ten times, uh, You put one dollar, became you know, uh, you get nine, nine uh, ten dollars back, uh, right? Is is forty seven thousand percent? Is four hundred and seventy times, you know, your money. Wow. <laughs> oh, which I invested in them in the early days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a huge opportunity. You see, what happened? In September 2022, as recent as September, oh, excuse me, September 2022, a lot of people just brush Nvidia off. If you want to say uh, when was the best time here, <laughs> I yeah, mean you well. missed it. If you missed it here, there was another time here. You see, yeah. So my cheap or expensive is not to do with share price. My cheap or expensive is usually what I call a multiple of their earnings or what we call a PE. Now in Google, uh, most of the information is freely available to you. It's this thing called the PE ratio. So what does PE actually mean? It means you take the total earnings of the company and you divide it against the market cap. Oh, no, sorry, the other way around. You take the market cap of the company, which is here, 971 billion, okay, close to a trillion. And you divide against the earnings of the company. Well, what is the earnings of the company? The earnings of the company is here. Uh, here, net income. You see, four three six eight four point three billion. So you take nine hundred billion, nine hundred seventy one billion. You divide against four hundred and four thousand three hundred and sixty eight million or four point three billion. You should get this ah. Uh, 204 times. What does this mean, Louis? It means that I put in my money. If I buy NVIDIA today, I will need 204 years to return my original invested capital. Okay. It sounds like okay. a lot of years. Sounds like a lot of years, right? Two, two wow. generations. Uh, no, three generations. Uh. I don't think all of us can live to 100, right? <laughs> oh. yeah. So just to give you an indication, what is uh, what is Google? Okay, let's look, look at Google. Uh. Google is selling to you for 28 times. Hmm. So when I talk about much, much whether less. it's cheap or expensive, I only need 28 years to return my original investment. That's what it means. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So valuations play a critical role in determining whether it's your good time, it's a good time for, for you to buy or to sell. Actually, technically now it's a good time to sell Nvidia. I mean, if you were a shareholder. <laughs> Yeah, and you want to make some profit, it would be a good time for you to 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 sell, uh. But yeah, I think there has been a, a bit of sell sell as well like, recently. Yeah. yeah, yes, they have they have been. I think if you look at the past five days, yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a sell off. You look at here, it hit about four hundred, and then if you're lucky enough, 
I think when was the results released? Huh? NVIDIA results, recent results. That was what caused the share, you know what caused the share price to spike, uh, um, Louis? Because analysts forecasted lower revenue and lower profit. And they actually surprised the entire market. Oh, because yes, yes, it surprised the entire market. I mean, we, we have to read business news every day, even on the weekend, all right? So, because <laughs> when, when we help manage uh, clients' money, it's like you have to be on the ball, uh, right? So, they actually announced results exceeding all analysts' forecasts, estimates, and that kind of surprised oh, the market. The analysts, uh, we have to trust ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. And I don't think even Jensen even knew that he was surprised. Oh. You, I mean? you oh. as a business owner, how will you know whether your profit will be good or bad? Right. It all depends right. on the customer, right. ma. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's yeah. True. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, it surprised every uh, surprised all the estimates, and that's why the market just like piled because onto the stock because um, everyone's expecting a recession. And a downturn, especially for the semicon industry. But NVIDIA actually just like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, upturn that assumption, that hypothesis. And markets uh, actually like to price it in because it's like, oh, wow, you know, I'm like, uh, yeah, this is the, 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 the only lighthouse that still like lighted up comparatively to all the gloom in the other, the other parts. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so far, um, these are the four questions you usually ask. Um, what business are they doing? Are they profitable? How big their audience is? And whether it's cheap or expensive. Do you have any oh. other questions, Louis? Yeah, so, so one on the cheap or expensive. So for you right now, it's expensive, right? Considerably. Yes, at 200 times, definitely. <laughs> uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know that tool I, I use, like Ticker? Hmm. Uh, there's actually this valuation tab over here and you can actually see historically what is the valuations like has been. Mm -hmm. You can actually plot it, you know. So you look for this thing. Okay, wait, uh, it's somewhere here. Next 12 months, or oh, this is forward. Okay, trailing. So don't worry about the term. N NTM is just stands for next 12 months. And what I want to look for is trailing. So trailing it will come with this term called ltm or last 12 months so i'm looking for last 12 months price to earnings uh, ev price over diluted eps okay this one price to earnings pe so you can see right i try to drag all so this is zero it's been trading in negative okay you look at 2009, uh, uh, why is it negative? Is because the earnings was negative. Huh? It means they made a loss. Huh? But historically, they've always traded around 20. Okay, so they were trading around 20 times. Then peaked in 2020, 11, they were trading about 60 times. And yeah, there are opportunities when they traded on only about 15 times. 15, on average, 15, 20. You can see my numbers, right, uh, Louis? Yeah, 15, 20. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, you're here. You're 100 over times, 200 times, okay? But normally, you're trading around, even at the like high peak, uh, you're talking about 99 times, 80 times. Okay, even here, 80 times, 60 times already, like, wow, okay? Your average, uh, if you, you notice, the, the I, I dragged the whole thing. My ah, it's actually here. Can you see? The mean is 32 times. My high is 218, obviously now. The low is minus 224. And the last is 205. So why why I'm showing you this band? This band is to determine what is the average normal that it should be. And in the in the investing space, we always have this term called reversion to the mean. That means when you're down, if a good company, right, if you're very high in terms of multiple, it will come down back to the mean. If you're very low, if you're a good company, you also revert back to the mean. So this is what we mean by reversion to the mean. Uh. That's why we look at this kind of charts to know, hey, what's the normal 
range of multiples that NVIDIA should be trading at. Okay, yeah. Uh, Louis, you're muted. So, like, should we should we wait for that to happen before we buy again? Is, uh, yeah, is that the yeah, right way to yeah, think about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In so a way, let's have to wait until like it's almost close to that thirty two point seven six. Wow, it's, seems, seems it's, like it's, a very it's not far. it's not precise, uh, It's not precise, uh -huh. Louis. It's not a precise a, 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 exactly. Uh, it's an art, you know. It's right. like you say two hundred times it's expensive. But then if they like triple their sales next year. Yeah, true. And then they triple the net profit. Then what happens? Okay, let's use a doubling. Uh. Let's just say they double their sales next year. Double. Uh. That means from 26 billion, they double it to 52 billion in one year. Okay. And then their profit also doubled from 4 billion to this one's 4.3 over to like 8. What happens to my multiple? Assuming share price don't move. Half is it? Half, correct. If I quadruple, that means I divide by four. So from a hundred, two hundred PE, it became a fifty PE, which is normal. So that's why that's why people like to price it forward. It's like that's why analysts forecasts are kind of like way, the way they want to like price it forward. Ah, uh, yeah, trailing is two hundred, but next year they're gonna earn thirty percent more. So that means my forward PE is like hundred fifty times. For example, I'm just giving you a number. So, you see, see that's why that's why analysts try to forecast because they're trying to say hey if i guess it correctly i'm actually buying it cheap now even though it looks trailing is 200 you see so i know it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a different world i mean analyst world high finance world but that's the usage of uh, uh forward uh, forward earnings estimate is estimates uh. Well, it's definitely an art. We probably need to need to you know get a hands dirty to slowly learn la, What's the yeah. what's the art like? Correct. Okay, correct, correct. I, I think I think it's uh, quite clear from the numbers where Nvidia stands. But um, I think for me, I have some more bigger questions around like the future, right? Okay, so we no have problem. about like um, analysts, you know, thinking they might they 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 have this estimate. Maybe they earn more, right? That definitely has to come from some kind of prediction or bet about certain growth and I, and I assume that's from AI right Correct. so now um, we are very excited because we see like all oh, the prices going up and we think okay maybe we'll keep continuing but we've seen this before John we have seen this mm. before these are called bubbles right we had a crypto bubble we had dot com bubbles right. are we in an AI bubble <laughs> I, I think we are and i tell you why uh. so I mean I've heard this many times uh, but hearing it when your mind wasn't prepared my mind wasn't prepared back then and hearing it now and hearing it maybe 10 years from now when i gather more experience and hopefully more wisdom was this they say that if your auntie in the hype in the uh wet market or your taxi driver is talking about the stock it's time to sell hmm. i don't know if you heard of this Wis no, wisdom before so so it sounds so simple as like if your mom is talking about it and she's not in the stock market. Okay, your mom's different. Okay, different sampling. Okay, but <laughs> but if if someone you know who has never been into investing, never been in the capital market, start talking about this particular stock. Oh, this stock A or crypto is hot, right? Becomes mainstream, right? And everyone's like trying to pile into it. It's time to get out. Why? Because actually, it's such a simple nuance. But the nuance is actually this. That means that people who have not understood it well enough but heard it as a headline and there's a lot of buzz around it are starting to put money into it. That means there's a bubble. It's an indication of a bubble. Oh, wow. Okay, that's kind of so, scary. So something so simple, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. that means right, people who don't know, haven't done their work, but feel that they can make money, what you are, what you are actually buying into, you're buying into hope. Right. You're buying into Perfect. hope you buy into a, a, a promise, somewhat of a promise of making money, right? And and when everyone, including, you know, um, people who are not in the tech space start talking about chat GPT, like it's the next sliced bread, right? You will know that it's time to be cautious. I think that's the word I would use. Right? It's time to be cautious. Yeah. So the next question will be, when do we know that we are, we, we are outside the bubble now? Like the bubble has burst and it's time to uh -huh. really like have a critical lens Okay, let's use, you mentioned crypto. I would say crypto now has its bubble burst. Or you just realize that people don't talk about 
um, NFTs NFT. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. People don't talk about farming anymore. I don't know if you realize that or not. Yeah, right? I, do. I do. Yeah, yeah. And that's where opportunities are being found. Hmm. Any asset class. You talk about property. People will tell you, oh, property is dead. It's not worth buying. While there's some truth to it, that means that you have not dig hard enough. I'm very sure some property experts somewhere has found a fantastic deal because someone didn't have the holding power. The market is, there's no competition because if everyone's out of the market and there was a good deal and if the market was hot, everyone would be fighting for it. Just say, hey, property can make money. Everyone will be fighting for that good property. And what happens when everyone's fighting? The price will go up. But when everyone's out, there's only like three or four guys with the holding power, with the dry powder, and you know, no one's competing against you. What happens? This, this, you, you can get a good deal, a good offer, and then you wait. And to back to your question, that's exactly how you know when you're out of the bubble, when everyone has just thrown it away. Everyone doesn't care about it. Everyone says there's no opportunity. That's when you're really out of the bubble. What, what, when even your cab driver is talking about it and no, no condescending or demeaning <laughs> uh, 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 um, comments towards cab driver. But when someone who is not in the market starts talking about it, that's when you know you're really in a bubble. Well, I, I, think, I think it's just, it's just all the formal going on. Right? Yes. People, yes. people want, yeah, they feel like, oh, am, am I actually missing out on something, right? If I don't invest now, you know, what if it goes up even higher? Right? Yeah, that's the, exactly. That's the, exactly. So exactly. About, I, I think uh, every, I think we have so many bubbles lately. Like we have that crypto and then I thought it might have like cooled down a bit, but now we have the AI bubble all of a Correct. sudden when all right. ChatGPT was launched in November. I mean, we, we still don't know where, where AI is headed. We don't know if it will be profitable. And then there's also like moral questions around AI. Yeah, you're spot on. About stations. Have you heard of this yeah. term called stations? I'll uh, say no. That means um, S-A-T-I-E-N-C-E. -E. No, no. Stations, wait. I don't even know how to pronounce it correctly. Yeah, okay. Uh, the quality of being able to experience feeling. So oh, they said AI oh, okay. is gonna be okay. alive, woke, hmm. or, or or have emotional, <laughs> like, uh, you know, we we watched about the hero uh, uh movie Big Hero Six, you know, you know. Hmm. So, I think the moral question with regards to um, how how will AI actually impact our lives? have uh, some kind of control over what we think or whatever that influence. I think it's like, um, if you watch a lot of documentary channels today, there's always two school of thoughts. Uh, one guy is saying, we cannot, re we, it's too dangerous to release it out in public. Mm, okay. Yeah. The other, the other, the other uh, end of the spectrum says, unless we leave it up to experiment, how can we progress as a human race? So there's always these two two differing thoughts, uh, and most of it will be hinged around a moral moral question about it. Uh, like, are you uh, are you destroying other people's jobs? The other group of people will say, no, this is creative destruction. It forces humanity to progress and to upgrade and to upskill. You know, so yeah. Yeah, I think uh, with regards to Nvidia, they actually like I I don't know if you saw the in-game avatars. That they created. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yes. I've seen some of it, yes. Right, like now you can, like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some errors in, in there in terms of like reality, la, but they're able to talk to the the NPCs now, right? So it used to be yes. like, like to get writers to write the script, etc. But now they can, you know, come up with the scripts just like ChatGPT does, you know. So they're saying, okay, you know, so many jobs will be wiped out, you know. Then I, I think I think for now maybe the governments will haven't clamped down on this issue, but there's no telling right in the future what will happen to this, and if we put all our eggs in this basket, is it, uh, is is it actually the right decision right? There's still that big question that remains unanswered. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, I think right now I I'm no expert in AI. And obviously, we, we listen to logics from both sides of the camp. And obviously, it's kind of like a wait and see attitude for me to determine what's the progress. I mean, you are in the space where, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the advertising, uh, customer funneling and all that. And you, you, you have even written 
things publicly about how it will change uh, the landscape. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But we, we also wouldn't know the firm yeah. answer. We, right? we don't know. We don't know. We don't have crystal ball. We, we, yeah. we can only predict. I mean, I mean, I think, I think sometimes when we're in certain positions in, in life, we, we, we project from where we stand. Yes. Rather than, you know, like we, we, we can't really predict. We, we can only project, okay, this is what we think might happen based on what we know today. But yeah. the future, it may be different, right? So I think um, that that's something that most of us need to consider when we invest into anything related to AI. La. Precisely. Yeah. Coming Precisely. back to Nvidia's business, right? Okay. So right now we know that Nvidia um, is, the, is the hardware behind about 80% of the AI stuff out there. But what's the chance of another company doing the same thing, right? Enroaching into that share, market share? And uh, we know that question. growing, but what if, you know, they lose that market share? Um, there's always a possibility of someone coming in it. Uh, but I think where the advantage that uh, NVIDIA actually had, they've been working on this for many, many years. Many, many years. I mean, prior to it being public listed, uh, they've, they've gotten into it for many years. Um, the struggle for most, actually, even some of NVIDIA's customers, that means the cloud computing data 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 centers, they're actually building, starting to build their own chips, Louis. So guys like oh. Google, guys like Azure, uh, they're building their own chips, not because they don't like NVIDIA's technology, but Okay, here I'm gonna get a little bit technical, but bear with me. NVIDIA's chips has to be built to satisfy all the users, all the applications. But certain specific applications, they're not the most efficient. And when they're not the most efficient, they draw out a little bit more power. And power actually is cost. Because the, 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 the higher processing power you need to do one job, if you like build another processor that can be more power efficient, obviously it's, and you scale that up multiple times, obviously you would want to go for the more power efficient processor that does more efficiently as well. And why is it related to your question about competitors coming in is, they, the, their clients, uh, and NVIDIA's own clients are actually building their own processors, not so much to compete against NVIDIA and to start selling to other cloud providers, but because they realize that wow, my bread and butter, I need to be more efficient, operationally more efficient. They start designing their own chips. And um, that I foresee will put a little bit of a dampener on NVIDIA's growth. But for these guys to go and compete with NVIDIA and to like go into gaming, go into uh, automotive and all that, I don't think they will want to do it. I, I don't think it's their intention to do it at scale because NVIDIA is already right. there. It's almost like a, an entrenched leader. Lah. So I think that that would be the deterrent for most of the new uh, guys trying to come in because Google Google has money to burn. They've got ad dollars and they can do that. Uh, you could talk about Amazon. Amazon is also building their own uh, processors and Microsoft is also building their own processors. I think the one that I really like about the naming is actually Google's one. It's called TensorFlow. <laughs> oh, yeah, Tensor, TensorFlow. Tensor, the language, and then Flow, right? So it's not their intention to want to compete with NVIDIA. And I think that's the advantage that NVIDIA has. The second advantage that NVIDIA has, you realize all these guys have deep pockets. So any new guy want to come in to build, uh, unless you've got the money to burn, unless you've got the relationships that you've developed with TSMC, their manufacturer, uh, the sole manufacturer for all their chips, uh, it's going to be uh, 10, 20 years at least to like catch up to a certain market share to compete against NVIDIA. Mm. You get I me? Mean? Oh, would you say they have a very strong moat there? Very. I, 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 even though I'm not an investor, I, I regret not buying when it was like, like, because even at 60 times, I was like, wow, it's expensive, right? Now it's like 200 times, right? So oh, wow. I'm, just, I'm really hoping for a crash, to be honest. I'm really hoping something <laughs> turns bad for Nvidia and I like, and Jensen still bad, stays alive. He's quite young. It. He's yeah. like 60 plus, 60, 60, 60 or 62, I can't remember. Huh? Yeah, 60, 60. 60 yeah so i i'm pretty sure he's got at least i mean looking at how how fit he is probably another 20 years ago um yeah i i think it's a uh, quite uh, uh i wouldn't say they are not dethronable but i i i think they have quite a good mode lah 
Yeah. Mm, they probably take some time and a lot of capital, right? Just to yeah, eat up a, a lot, bit of a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. They okay. they virtually define gaming PCs, right. uh, gaming True. cards, you know, to be honest. Yeah, they virtually define the standards. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. true. And, and and to consider that the data centers are only one segment of their business. Right. right. There's so many of the rest where I don't think there's actually like a competitor in sight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So one last question before we get to the last section, which is the book recommendation is in our last episode, we talked about your favorite value investment. Sorry. Yeah. Your, we, we talked about your favorite value investor, Warren Buffett, and you went to his, um, the AGM for Berkshire Hathaway. So according to this one motley full um, report, they're saying, okay, Warren Buffett would not invest in NVIDIA because it's too expensive. What do you think from a value investor's perspective to maybe summarize, you know, NVIDIA? Um, I think just on the uh, on the obvious uh it's valuations are just too high i mean like earlier i answered like it's 205 times earnings right uh the second i think angle in which i want to address it from is even though it's profitable it's growing its revenue whatever um the free cash flow generation is also something very important for Buffett as his criteria. So what do I mean by free cash flow? Meaning whatever operating cash flow you have, net off the capex spend that Nvidia needs to uh, spend to run their day-to-day -day business, the balance of that is your free cash flow. <clears throat> and Warren likes to have this free cash flow as what he calls owner's earnings. Uh. And NVIDIA, in, in the very competitive technological landscape that, how do I say, uh, adapts to change very, very fast, I think Warren would be wary of how free cash flow generation would happen for NVIDIA. Because for NVIDIA to stay on top of the game, yes, they may not need to build factories to manufacture their chips, but they still need to invest in a lot of R&D, uh, uh, experimental work, to push the limits of their design to be able to be at the top of the game. And I think that's something that Warren uh, will find it difficult to predict. And for Warren, that's why predictability in free cash flow generation is also very, very key, which is like seldom talked about. It's not that Warren doesn't understand tech. He understands tech. But what he doesn't know, like he missed out on Amazon completely. <laughs> yeah. Right. And he admires Jeff Bezos. He thinks he runs a very tight ship. But the reason, what my guess, the reason why he didn't invest was that they didn't know AWS would have existed. They look mm. at Amazon at that time, yes, they were a very big <coughs> e-commerce platform, very dominant. And a AWS was a, 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 a bet, a moonshot that actually now commands a huge chunk of um, um, Amazon's earnings. But would sure. Warren be able to predict that at that point? No. So that's why, you know, like even TSMC, very predictable business, very high margins, but Warren cannot predict the geopolitical tension that is happening between Taiwan and China, whether they will go to war and all that. So for him, I'm like, what are the risks involved? Financial risk, no problem. Run a very tight ship, you know, uh, very high barriers to entry. For you to start a fabrication, so for semiconductor fabrication, you're talking about 10 billion minimum. Uh, and that's just capital cost, not talking about the talent you have to hire or that kind of thing. Warren has been through all that, but he says, what I cannot predict is geopolitical tension. So he said, okay, I'm off. So in NVIDIA's case, uh, geopolitical tension, uh, yeah, may impact NVIDIA because TSMC is manufacturing them. But I think the pace of technological change and the free cash flow generation is something that Warren cannot predict for NVIDIA. That, that's, my, that's my take. Mm -mm, that's very interesting. I think, I think um, Warren Buffett is quite like to me a very very conservative investor in mm. that in that way. Like he, he does wait things out, even though even if you know like he 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 has to come in at a later time, not the best price, but I think he has his principles that I think it's quite admirable. Admirable. Yeah, I don't. The patience is not easy the to practice, Louis. Like, 
to not to not give in to FOMO, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, he, he generated like massive returns over the years. Okay, so yeah, I think I think that some uh wrap things up for our discussion around Nvidia. Hopefully, um, our audience, you know, have found some useful tips for you to consider on your own. Uh, whether Nvidia is a buy for you right now or sometime down the road. It's okay, not financial so, advice. <laughs> not financial video. advice. Yeah, <laughs> just a tip. <laughs> okay, so so um, we'll we'll end this session uh with our last segment, which is the investing book recommendation. So every um video that we do around stock analysis for beginners, we want to also help you to um get started doing your own learning. And that's why we want to uh, end the video with one book recommendation each time. So what's one book investing book you would recommend new investors today, John? Yeah, um, this is, uh, I think in our part of the world, a uh, very, in Chinese we said, lenmen, uh, not very popular book, <laughs> okay? And very, <clears throat> very seldom people talk about it. Or obviously people talk about the intelligent investor. Yep. Or, yeah. or Peter Lynch, a very popular book. But this book was written by this guy called Jason Zwick. I don't know if I pronounced his name correctly. He's actually a business journalist. And he actually wrote the foreword for the latest edition of The Intelligent Investor. That's how I got to know him. Ooh. So if you look at the latest edition, I think edition seven or eight, he would he uh -huh. would have written the foreword to it. Okay. Oh, and yeah. um, the book, he, wrote, he, he has written many books, Jason Zwick. Um, this one was released in 2015. Uh, the title of the book is The Devil's Financial Dictionary. That actually caught my eye. I'm like, wow. <laughs> good, good ending, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and um, the, 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 even the cover of the book was pretty interesting, Louis, because oh. um, it's red in color and it just has a yeah. devil there. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> With the yeah. two horns, right? Yeah. Um, why should people read it? I think uh, why, uh, why should beginners actually read it is because it's actually, you shouldn't read it page to page. It's actually a dictionary. Right. So you don't read a, read a dictionary from A to Z, right? You read a dictionary, you want to refer. And especially those newcomers into invest, the world of investing, what's the one thing that scares a lot of people off? Uh, big words. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Big words, jargon. You know, jargon actually scares a lot of people. Ah, oh, what do you mean? So the beauty of that, this, this book is sorted A to Z like a dictionary. And if you look at, let's say, things like analysts, which is an A, right? And I just want to read off uh, <laughs> his term for analysts, which I, I think I think is very <laughs> quite humorous. Uh. Uh, the beauty about the book is this is so humorous, it's self-depreciating kind of humor. And it talks about the uh, the perils of what Wall Street makes it try to sound complicated and make it sound smart, but actually it's not. Okay, so let me find the analyst. Okay. Are you, analyst. Are you sure it's not a jokes book? Uh, it, it is kind of a jokes book, but it's also a fact, fact, backed. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah. Analyst, uh, a perpetrated, uh, a per -per -per perpetrated expert on a company in theory that <laughs> estimates its value by breaking it down into constituent parts, but in practice functions as a salesperson or cheerleader. Mm, so it's taking quite, a jab at analysts, but also quite accurate quite description true, about quite, it. Quite true. And, and I, think, okay. I think everyone who reads this would, would, would agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the guys who have written uh, uh, feedback about this book, including people like, okay, let me read the forewords uh, of some of these, <laughs> these guys. <laughs> So you heard of Robert Schiller? He's a he's a Nobel Nobel laureate yeah. in economics. Okay, the yeah, Schiller we call it the Schiller PE, yeah. right? So he wrote, "This is the most amusing presentation of principles of finance I've ever seen." Okay, now uh, we talked about Vanguard in our ETF episode. So yeah. jo John C. Bogle, before he passed on, he yeah. wrote this: "Someone had to write a short." punchy book on the fibs and fables of Wall Street <laughs> during the second Gilded Age for the extravagantly paid manipulator of our financial system. <laughs> Very direct, oh, wow. huh? Happily for the readers, whether wise, naive, or victimized. Okay. 
<laughs> Journalist Jason Zweck picked up the challenge and ran for the winning touchdown with it. Laugh, cry, and learn as you enjoy the sparkling devil's financial dictionary. I thought I thought there was a very apt description about this correct. book. Correct, right? absolutely correct. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I, I, I just never knew that such a book existed. I think, um, just from the entertainment point of view, all right, uh, right. I, I will read it for that. Correct. For that. Yeah. So, so, uh, there's another one. Okay, this is the, of open this wonderful. I'm sorry. Open this wonderful book to any page. Try not to laugh. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah I, I think it would be people like when you start laughing, people think, oh, maybe they're reading like a comic. Correct, 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 no, correct, no, no, correct. I'm actually learning financial terms. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So I think the three key takeaways for me is that it takes away the fear of big words from a lot of uh, beginning investors. Secondly, even if it doesn't, the it doesn't humor you because a lot of it is American. So if you kind of like you kind of be understanding a little bit about Wall Street and the jargon they use, right? Um, even with that, right, it actually gives you a kind of like a directed indication of what are the terms you need to be aware of. So you start you start digging mm. into it, you start reading other sources, and then you ask the right people, then they can tell you yeah, more about that term. The third, the third one is this. It's not a book that you can read end to end. So you think of it, it's a dictionary that you place on the shelf. And then whenever you you hear a new term, let's say someone in a blog or in a video like this came out with a term, you just go to the book, you open it up and you flip it. So it, you, you don't need to read it in one sitting or two sitting. That's the beauty about this book. You see, so I highly, highly recommend you to put it. Actually, there's another uh, feedback or comment. It says it's mandatory to be in any any investor's shelf. Mm, I, would, I, would, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely rushing to rushing to get a copy myself. <laughs> just, for, just, to <laughs> just for just for laughs, you know. <laughs> for laughs, just for laughs. Okay, yeah. Thanks so much, John, for sharing that one um new investing book. I I I've, I personally find it really useful. In the last episode, John shared the um One Up Wall Street by Peter Lynch. If you haven't seen it, just go to our previous episodes on invest stock investing from zero. Okay, so guys, I uh, hope that you have learned something new today around uh, Nvidia as well as stock investing in general. If you have any comments around what John has um, shared, you can share them in the comment sections below. And if you have enjoyed this series, make sure to like this video and also subscribe to our channel so you get uh, notified uh, on new videos. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys in the next video.